Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Christine Zagrabelny. I'm a software developer, and I'm a volunteer with the New Sanctuary Coalition. Um, and this is community-driven development. So today, we're going to talk about New Sanctuary Coalition's work. Uh, we'll talk about the process of building software to help them scale their work following the 2016 election. And then we'll talk about how we're building a community of software developers to maintain uh, the software and support New Sanctuary Coalition's other tech needs. Um, so first, New Sanctuary Coalition, NSC, um, is led by and for immigrants to stop the inhumane system of detentions and deportations in this country. Uh, this is Ravi Raghbir Center. He's the founder and executive director of New Sanctuary Coalition. Um, in this image, he's at his check-in with ICE, surrounded by the New Sanctuary Coalition community. So NSC has been around since 2007, and you know, over those 12 years, they've developed many programs um, to resist detention and deportation. And I'll talk about just four of those programs now. The first is the accompaniment program, which pairs undocumented people with trained volunteers who accompany them to their immigration hearings and check-ins with ICE. Um, so when our friends, and friends is New Sanctuary Coalition's term for our impacted community members, when our friends check in with ICE, there are a few potential outcomes. Uh, they could be told to come back in six months, they could be told to come back in three months or a week, or they could be detained on the spot. Um, the photo I just showed of Ravi Raghbir was taken as he was walking into a check-in in January 2018, where he was detained for several weeks and almost deported. So the goal of the accompaniment program is to provide support. You know, when you have a group of people who will wait with you and sit with you, the amount of stress and anxiety that you feel goes down. Um, and when our friends have to advocate for themselves, whether they have to ask something of an ICE officer or present their asylum case to an immigration judge, it will be easier for them to fight for their rights knowing that they have a group of people who are standing behind them. Many of our friends' family members can't come with them to check-ins because their own immigration status puts them at risk if they enter a NICE facility. So the accompaniment program can also keep family members informed and keep NSC informed during the process. The next program I'll talk about is the Pro Se Legal Clinic, which is a weekly clinic where our friends work with trained volunteers to plan for and understand their immigration case. Um, so this is an image from uh, our weekly clinic in New York. Uh, in this image, you'll see group teams of two or three volunteers who are each working with a friend um, on asylum applications, work authorization, other applications that they will need for their case, uh, and they're supervised by volunteer attorneys. So the anti-detention program works with detained immigrants um, across the U.S. and their families to fight for their release. And usually it's through a strategy that combines both the legal recourses available to the person and advocacy. Um, so, for example, on the left, this is Baba Silla's family calling for his release after he was unexpectedly detained at his check-in in January 2019. Uh, NSC Community Legal Defense represented Baba, and the NSC community came together to support him through letter writing, calling his deportation officer, a social media campaign. And on the right, NSC, uh, Baba Silla is reuniting with his family at the NSC offices. We also have a bond fund um, to help bond people out of immigration detention. And the last program that I'll talk about specifically is Sanctuary. So this is a network of religious spaces that offer short and long-term physical sanctuary to friends. So immigration authorities typically don't come into religious spaces to deport immigrants. So if an immigrant is named as a target for deportation, they may decide to take physical sanctuary and live in a religious space for an indeterminate amount of time. Um, this is Amanda Morales. Uh, on the left, she's with her children in the church space where she's living. And on the right, she's surrounded by the church community. Um, so these are just four of the ways that New Sanctuary Coalition fights detention and deportation. And now we'll take a look at how technology has helped New Sanctuary Coalition scale these programs uh, over the past three years. 
So when the 2016 election happened, uh, I was a volunteer in the Pro Se Legal Clinic. And at the time, I was working with a friend uh, and her son who had just started high school in New York. In Guatemala, our friend had received threatening notes and phone calls from a gang who was attempting to extort her. One day, uh, her son was approached by gang members at his school and told to leave the same threatening notes that his mother had received at another house. Knowing that her son's life was in immediate danger for refusing gang recruitment and for her for refusing extortion, our friend made the difficult decision to leave her home. She and her son traveled over a month to reach the United States from Guatemala, and then she established a new life for herself and her son um, in New York after being detained at the border um, and making, making her way up to New York. We had been working together for about four weeks at this point, and my small role in this was to listen and collect all the required information and put it into an asylum application, which she will then use as she continues for years to come to fight to stay here and to keep her son here as well. Um, so for each of our friends, the stakes are extremely high. And when the 2016 election happened, those stakes were compounded with a new level of fear. And as a result, New Sanctuary Coalition's program started growing rapidly. Over a couple of months, we went from having four friends at clinic every week to 40, which meant there were 40 teams, each working on an asylum application with a friend. Um, and after clinic, NSC staff needed copies of these applications to review during the week. They needed to track the asylum application deadlines, which are critical to a friend's case. They needed to keep track of upcoming ICE check-ins um, and court dates for each friend so they could be accompanied. Um, and this is difficult enough if every friend and every volunteer is able to come back to clinic every week for the four to six weeks that it takes to complete an asylum application. But of course, that's not possible. Um, so there's some amount of needing to hand off work so this important progress isn't lost. Um, and all of this sharing documents and triaging cases and putting together new teams for whoever you know, showed up at clinic that day had to be completed as quickly as possible um, in a small space that was crammed with 150 people um, at the beginning of clinic. And it wasn't sustainable. And that carried a potentially huge cost uh, for our friends. So I had a really strong motivation to work on a solution for this problem. Um, and I, was, I was motivated by this, the work of this community, by the leadership of our friends, by volunteers who were stepping up and meeting challenges on a daily basis, who would stay as late as necessary to complete an asylum application with an impending deadline. Um, we have a listserv for volunteers and staff would send out a message. And you know, one of our friends has just been released from a detention center in New Jersey. Can anyone like drive out there and meet them? And within 10 minutes, I'd see another message saying, thanks, we got someone. Um, and I was very motivated by staff who were not only relentlessly improving logistics, but they were doing everything that they could to keep, to make sure that no one fell through the cracks. So I had a strong motivation and we needed a plan. Uh, and the first part of that is requirements. And because I was immersed in the work, I had a huge head start uh, in understanding requirements. I had a strong sense of the priority of features, and I also knew what aspects of their work were likely to change and stay the same. Uh, and this was really helpful because in all of the chaos um, and you know, time pressure of this moment, it wasn't gonna be possible to have all of the meetings that it takes to get from zero to 100 in terms of really understanding these requirements. So after we determined that there wasn't any software on the market that was gonna meet the most important uh, requirements that they had, um, I was able to put together wireframes uh, for a Rails application and the staff uh, worked with me to fine tune them. 
And you know, since the MVP, we have built features for programs that they're not currently running, but they're intending to run really soon. And um, those have always required a lot more adjustment after the fact, because there are things that I don't anticipate, and they wind up running the program a little bit differently than they imagine in practice. So now I try to hold the line um, and build features for work that they're currently doing. So after requirements, we needed a timeline. And we had a conversation about this, and it was pretty clear that uh, a solution that wasn't available in three months wasn't going to be a viable solution. So that timeline helped us uh, set the scope of work for the MVP um, a, a little bit more conservatively. So you know, your small, scrappy nonprofits who are doing the work on the ground, they probably don't know that software needs to be maintained. I don't think that's like general knowledge, but as a developer, I knew that if I built it, I would be on the hook to maintain it. Um, so that was my biggest consideration in making the decision to offer to build the MVP. I kind of imagined I would be you know, committing to uh, spend a certain amount of time every week for bug fe features, for bug fixes and feature requests, probably for about you know, three years would be kind of the minimum. Um, and over those several years, uh, I've come to understand that it's, it's not just those two things. Uh, there's a lot of project management, um, a lot of QA, some open source maintainer stuff, as well as security and uptime issues uh, that are also priorities. And obviously, I'm using the term maintenance really broadly to just mean everything that has to happen for software to be able to be used uh, over, the long, over, over the long haul. And we've also seen this play out with um, out-of-the-box software, that solutions that we've um, implemented for them at NSC, because you know, you're not going to be maintaining the code of that software, but they could need you know, configuration changes down the line in order to be able to continue to use the software in the long run. So I think uh, for any sort of project, whether you're building custom software or not, it's a good thing to evaluate the, the long-term need. And, you know, I, I knew, lastly, that there would be some amount of training and support required, but I definitely underestimated it. I mean, I underestimated how much time it would take, and I also kind of thought it was going to be a one-time thing versus an ongoing need, but I, I did a combination of video demos and in-person training. The video demos get out of date as you add new features. And with in-person training, new staff come on. Maybe a staff member hasn't used a feature in a while, and now they need to, and they don't really remember what we talked about initially. Um, and as you build features that are more complex, it's usually more efficient to talk about them in person. And I'm consistently reminded about how important this is whenever I sit down with a staff member and they tell me, you know, oh, it would be so great if the software could do this. And I'm like, oh, it can. And um, so I'm just constantly reminded that if they don't know how to use features in the software, uh, they're not going to. And we've also seen this play out with other um, out-of-the-box software solutions that we've implemented for them. Um, another tech volunteer, Rebecca, has become an expert in the volunteer management CRM that they use, Nation Builder. And the software would honestly be used in a pretty limited way if she hadn't invested all the time and energy um, in training them how to use the software and advising them how to use it and, and getting them set up with things. So I had the motivation, I had the plan, and the third thing that was really critical for the project to be successful uh, was shared values, which really boils down to, you know, how do you work with other people in the community, and how do you view the work that you're doing? And these values up here, you know, they were developed for New Sanctuary Coalition's Pro Se Legal Clinic, um, but I share them because I think many of them are transferable to work with other organizations, and um, they've definitely provided a really strong foundation for this project. So, no ego. It's not about us as volunteers. Uh, no drama. I mean, staff deal with emergencies on a daily basis. And in order to move any sort of project forward, 
you will have to do more you know, leg work and follow up and accommodation of changing priorities. Um, and so it's important to just empathize with the challenges that leadership are, are facing. Um, no savior complexes. Uh, as NSC volunteers, we are standing in solidarity with people who have more courage than most of us will ever have. You know, when our friends argue their asylum case in front of an immigration judge, when they walk into an ICE check-in not knowing if they will come back out, when they are imprisoned for months or years fighting their deportation, they're putting their body on the line for their right and the right of others to live in dignity. So our friends are leading this movement, and we are standing behind them. And in the work that you do with organizations, it's really important to take leadership from impacted community members. Problem solve. So as technologists, we have this broad perspective on technology, which can be really useful in solving problems. You know, we don't just have the languages um, and technology stacks on our resumes. We kind of understand how it all fits together, and we're not afraid of it. And it's really important to recognize the value in that, because the important work isn't the sexy work. Uh, and it's not necessarily the work that uses what you think of as your most valuable skills. Supporting a migration to G Suite isn't sexy. But if staff are losing tons of important emails from funders and lawyers to spam, it might be the most important work in that moment. Um, helping someone get set up with a password manager is not going to use your programming or design skills but it's so critical to protect the community. So, you know, in addition to these two things, we've had New Sanctuary Coalition tech volunteers re-image donated laptops, um, maintain, redesign, and then ultimately migrate like a static information site, and as well as set up a volunteer management CRM, which meant that they were able to accept donations securely, that they could schedule and accept RSVPs to trainings, that they could send bulk email and send segmented email to volunteers and supporters. You know, that said, it is important to learn and respect your own boundaries and what you can commit to, because not doing that hurts you, um, but it also ultimately hurts the organization. And lastly, you know, total communication. There's a lot to be said for you know, being in person as a volunteer as the basis of your work as a technologist because you learn how the organization works, who you need to talk to, what's the best way to communicate with them. And you do that without putting you know, additional burden on staff um, to provide you with the answers to these questions. And at the same time, you build mutual trust with the people that you're working with, which you know, is, is really important for good communication. So we had motivation, plan, shared values. We were able to build the MVP with functionality that addressed um, some of the problems that we talked about earlier. We obviously wanted a central place for admins to be able to access um, digital records for the friends that NSC is working with. So here they can you know, search by various fields. We wanted them to be able to edit these records, obviously. Um, we wanted them to be able to add um, upcoming ICE check-ins or court hearings, anything that the friend um, would be accompanied to. That's the activities here. We wanted um, admins to have a running list of all of the, um, the drafts of asylum applications and other applications that have been worked on in clinic, you know, attached to the friend's record. And we wanted volunteers to be able to upload um, these documents for the friend that they were working with. And to do that, they needed to be able to be given access, a limited, limited amount of access, to a specific um, friend's record that they were working with in clinic. And this is from the volunteer's perspective. They're working with this friend in clinic. They can view all of the documents um, that have been uploaded for the friend to date, and then they can upload new documents when they have a new version at the end of clinic. And obviously, the accompaniment program volunteers, you know, they're now able to 
RSVP, um, view all the accompaniments for the next couple weeks, and RSVP um, to accompany. So, you know, the programs continued growing. Um, and with support from this software and New Sanctuary Coalition's other tech efforts. So, you know, starting with accompaniments, generally we were doing accompaniments for about 10 friends uh, each week in August 2017. Now we're organizing accompaniments for between 50 to 70 friends each week. Uh, likewise, um, starting with 30 volunteers accompanying weekly um, in August 2017. By summer 2019, you know, we're somewhere between 125 to 175 volunteer shifts um, being filled weekly in New York. Likewise, the Pro Se Legal Clinic. Um, in August 2017, we had around 40 friends uh, attending clinic each week. That spiked to 150 in spring. Um, before we restructured clinic to keep the numbers around 100 and make it more sustainable in the long, long term. And the volunteer numbers um, aren't up here, but uh, we at this point have around 300 volunteers attending clinic uh, every week in New York. And you know, once we started to use the software in production, it became more and more integral part of New Sanctuary Coalition's day-to-day work. And because of that, you know, it was really imperative to make it sustainable in the long term. Because it didn't start from a sustainable place. Um, my company does summer Fridays, so I'd work half day Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and then two nights during a week for about two and a half months uh, to get the MVP out. And on Sundays, uh, I get together with a couple other radical coders and we just hack on the project for a couple hours, which was a huge morale boost. Um, so we got to August 2017, got the, got the software deployed, got the users migrated and all the user invitations sent. And then I was, just, I was just really burnt out for a couple months. Um, and you know, I wanted to get other contributors on the project um, to make it more sustainable. And so I thought, hack events. I can, I can rope in some developers there. So um, in August, or sorry, in December, we participated in our first uh, hack event. It was hosted by Progressive Hack Night in New York. And to get ready for this, I did you know, a lot of the things that um, first-time contributors need, like good seed data, a good readme, easy setup. Um, and it also really influenced the way that I wrote issues, because I made a couple of assumptions. I assumed that the developers would not have any experience um, with this software. They wouldn't know the code base. I was assuming that um, I wouldn't know the experience level that they would be bringing in. And I also kind of knew from experience that you know, miscommunication around um, what what we're building and how we're building it, you know, it really sucks and can lead to a lot of unusable work. And I wanted to avoid that. So to compensate for all of those things, I just started writing really prescriptive issues that just included a lot of very specific implementation details. And they took a long time to write. But I thought, you know, this is just, it's just an investment um, to get this long-term contributors that I wanted. But heading into summer 2018, you know, we needed to make the app multi-tenant. We needed to make some changes um, to support clinics outside of New York. And I kind of divided that work up into a couple phases. Um, I did a solo sprint to make the multi-tenant changes, which is that big spike in the middle. And then the project was featured at Ruby for Good. Uh, and we had a team of engineers all working on the project for a couple days and knocked out some of the functionality for clinics outside of New York. And then I had a final sprint to finish everything up and get it all merged and deployed. And you know, of course, after that, I was just burned out again. And you know, I realized that um, I, wasn't, I wasn't meeting my goal of getting these long-term contributors. And I had been putting all of this effort into making the project just work really well for hack events. But I wasn't putting any effort into retaining contributors um, after I was introduced to them at these events. So I started thinking about you know, what motivates someone to contribute long term. Like what motivated me 
and what motivated um, my current and former coworkers, Tasha and Russell, who had begun to contribute more regularly over the past year, and you know, how could I build on this and make it part of the experience for everyone? So I mentioned before that you know, I was really motivated by community, uh, by the New Sanctuary Coalition community, and that was true of many um, of the other volunteers. And in reflecting on how NSC has been so effective in building this community, you know, I realized that there were a couple different aspects of working in this community that I wanted to extend and replicate. Um, and the first of those is connection to the work. So as an NSC volunteer, you are sitting in an ICE facility and waiting um, with someone. You are sitting across the table and working together on an asylum application. Uh, the person-to-person -person connection is like a foundational part uh, of the community. And it occurred to me that Tasha and Russell had been working on this project for about a year, and they hadn't seen clinic in person, they hadn't seen any of the programs in person. Um, and so first chance I had, I invited them to come to clinic and to meet everyone um, and to see the software actually being used um, in person. And that's something that I you know, continue with regular contributors um, whenever and however I can get them to New York uh, to have that in-person connection with the work. Because building a connection to the work takes time. I mean, I had been volunteering with New Sanctuary Coalition for three years before I wrote any code. Um, and I realized that one thing, you know, but, but during that time, I, I kept getting email updates from New Sanctuary Coalition. I kept coming back. Eventually, I became part of the community. And I realized that one thing I had done with Tasha and Russell was just kind of keep them in the loop on you know, what was happening at New Sanctuary Coalition, which was easy to do because we're friends and we're talking anyway, and we just you know, kind of come up. Um, and so I realized it was really important for all of the contributors to hear about what's happening at New Sanctuary Coalition on a regular basis so that you know, they can start to build that connection to the work over time um, and become increasingly invested. So, I started a New Sanctuary Coalition tech monthly newsletter, and the first thing uh, in this newsletter is an update on what New Sanctuary Coalition has been doing this month, um, highlights so that they understand the work on a deeper level. And you know, in addition to understanding the work more broadly, you know, I realized it was really important for them to understand the work, the, the impact of their work specifically. So, that has definitely informed the way that I structure issues in the repo. When a contributor picks up an issue, the first thing that they see is a background section that lays out like, what is the real world um, need for this issue? What will be better in the world um, if this is completed? So working together, you know, whether at hack events or um, at uh, volunteering at NSC in person, you know, is an aspect of community that is just really energizing. And I wanted to create some structure so that this could happen for this project on a regular basis. And um, so the first thing was that, you know, we host a virtual co-working night each month on Zoom for a couple hours. Um, contributors can come and go and, and work, hack on the project and uh, chat. And um, in the monthly newsletter, you know, I also shout out all of the work that we've completed this month because it's important, you know, it's, it's really energizing to see the work of the tech community as a whole and what we're getting done together. And I also, the monthly newsletter has given me a structure to provide like regular invitations um, for contributors to participate in the work of the community. So I'm able to preview the current and upcoming work uh, at a, on, on a regular interval. And you know, the last aspect of community that I want to make sure was embedded um, in the project was shared values and goals. So of course, you know, we've incorporated New Sanctuary Coalition's mission um, and their values into our code of conduct. But I think you know, these values play out the most in interactions and decisions um, that We've made, for example, um, 
you know, we've decided to include all of the tech projects and all tech volunteers um, at NSC in this newsletter in this community because um, it's not just the, the code, uh, not just the open source contributions that are, um, are making the work of this community possible. So, um, because the important work isn't the sexy work, and we want all the work to be visible. And, you know, if our goal is to support NSC tech needs, sometimes that's going to involve uh, prioritizing across different projects, and it's going to involve, you know, a lot of different skills, uh, not just uh, Ruby and Rails. So, I hope that you may go out and decide to be an organization's tech friend. Um, you know, go out and find the organizations in your community that are led by people who are directly impacted by the issues that they are working on. And, you know, the organizations who are doing the work on the ground with no resources. Um, and be part of the community first. And then problem solve those big problems or the small problems. And, you know, lastly, invest in community because community in your work, both as a technologist and, you know, as an organizer, is the only way that any of this is ever going to be sustainable. So thank you. Uh, I have some links for you. You can learn more about New Sanctuary Coalition. You can donate to help them continue to do this work. Uh, you can donate to the Bond Fund. We're currently in New York, um, but we hope to have accompaniment programs in other states in the future. And if you do a little Googling, you know, you may find that there is an accompaniment program run by a different organization near you. Uh, you can also, you know, contribute to the open source project. We have open issues at the moment. Um, and learn how you can get involved with the new Sanctuary Coalition tech community more broadly. And also, I'll be around after, and I would, you know, really love to chat with you about any of this. Um, so, thank you.